Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear nursing staff, healthcare providers, ancillary staff, whoever is joining this transmission, thanks for being with me for next 30 minutes to an hour. I would like to thank uh, Titus Regional Hospital for providing me with an opportunity to present and discuss um, during this series of nursing education lectures. Um, my topic for today is blood thinners. And the reason why I chose this, because I think for physicians as well as I think for ancillary staff nurses, uh, this is a topic where we find that you know, very often there are so many medications out there that we are juggling with. And the question comes to our mind all the time for different disease states, when do we start these medications? When do we stop these medications? There is always something new out there on the market which is being introduced. There are so many indications for these agents um, that I thought that this was an important topic um, to discuss and uh, consider and going over some of the basic questions which, you know, which may come up during this talk and whatever you know, the questions are, we'll try to um, answer those uh, to the best of our ability. Um, I have some slides uh, which are uh, detailed and I'm just gonna browse through those slides quickly because I don't want to delve into a whole lot of physiology or mechanics of things. However, uh, I would like to spend and take the opportunity out of those slides to spend more time and answer any practical nursing questions which you may all have um, pertinent to this discussion. So um, I'll start. These are the uh, points that I'm going to try to cover during this uh, presentation today. Um, what kind of different antiplatelets and anticoagulants do we have? Um, and I'll go over the list. Um, what are the mechanism of action and the half-life? How do the antiplatelets work and how do the anticoagulants work? What are the different indications to use these agents? And do they have any antidote or reversal agents? So those are some of the things that we'll try to cover in this today's discussion. And you know, the interesting thought is that it's a safety mechanism, if you all think of it. When we have a cut, all these agents come into play and help us stop bleeding. So it's a milieu. And same thing happens inside the body that we have our own agents which prevent the blood from clotting inside our system. So we have our intrinsic system available to us as well so that we don't have clotting disorders in our body. And all these, all these agents are at work um, trying to help us from having these kind of problems. Um, so with that, this next slide will show you what different antiplatelets do we have. Very common one, aspirin, of course, Plavix, and you can see and you can read from the list, Prasugril, the other name is Affiant, Brilenta, Cangrelor, Varoxipar, and then we have some of these IV antiplatelet agents that I have listed, Ciximab, Integrin, Agristat. Of course, you don't have to memorize these, but I've created a list as a reference, so if you ever have a question and you want to come back, and take a look, you will have an idea of, all right, you know what? This drug is an antiplatelet and not an anticoagulant. And it's important to have that distinction because they all work differently on different pathways from different um, mechanistic viewpoint. So it's important to know this. One of the common things that I've noticed, you know, not with the nursing staff, but even with physicians dealing in different specialities that there is just so much out there that the, the, the theme commonly gets mixed. People will talk about blood thinners and they will be talking about anticoagulants thinking it's an antiplatelet. Therefore, I thought you know, to have a list of these agents on one place. So what are some of the different anticoagulants? And the next slide will bring that up. So you have warfarin, which has been around for almost 50 years now, rat poison, which we commonly use for certain disease states, Similarly, we have now for last 10 years some of the other anticoagulants which we use, oral anticoagulants, Eliquis, Xeralto, 
dabigadrin, edoxaban, then we have some of the subcutaneous agents, IV agents, which I've listed, the heparin, the lovenox, fondaparinox, angiomax, argatroban, leprudin. So if you come across these names, this is the list which tells you that these are the anticoagulants and not the anaplatelets because they all work differently. So why do we need these agents? What are the indications? What disease states do we have to use these um, and we start these agents? So some of the common ones for antiplatelets, I have not listed all of those out there, but some of the common ones which you routinely come across, a lot of patients have coronary artery disease, a lot of them have strokes and transient ischemic attacks, a lot of patients come in with peripheral vascular disease, and these are the disease entities where you will commonly use the, commonly see the use of antiplatelet agents, uh, may it be aspirin or Plavix or Berlinta or Prasugril, Effient, those are the four common ones which you will use interchangeably among these different entities. But there are certain other disease states as well. And for just to keep the topic concise, I have not included those. I'll, I'll say some. For example, you know, having some of the um, disease states where your platelet counts are high, uh, throm polycythemia vera, essential thrombocytosis, those are the disease states where you use the um, anaplatelets, and so forth and so on. You know, HIT, HIT, where you use some anticoagulants, not the anaplatelets, but those are some of the extra disease states that which I have not listed. So when you think of anticoagulants, when do you use the anticoagulants? You commonly use it for prophylaxis, day in, day out for your patients. When they come in, um, they get the DVT prophylaxis, those of Lovenox, um, similarly, if they have acute DVT or pulmonary embolism, they're going to get these anticoagulant agents, may it be Coumadin, may it be Eliquis, Xeralto, or Debigatrin. Similarly, we use them for prevention of stroke in AFib patients, patients coming with mechanical heart valves, or if they have a LVAD device inside their heart, you know, they are on anticoagulants. Similarly, if they have a thrombus in their left ventricle, they, the indication is to use the anticoagulants. So these are some of the disease states where we use them. So before moving on to the next phase of the talk, I, I have a question which um, it's listed. So you're seeing a 56-year-old female today around 3 p.m. with a history of hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, atrial fibrillation. There is morbid obesity involved. Um, she's admitted with right upper quadrant pain and the diagnosis is acute cholecystitis. She'll need surgery. At the present time, she's chest pain. She's she's pain free in the belly, uh, and hemodynamically stable. She's on Eliquis for AFib and scheduled for surgery next morning, which is tomorrow morning. The last dose of Eliquis was last night. That is prior to admission. How would you manage Eliquis in this scenario? And as a nurse, this is a very important information that we should gather in such patients. What was the last dose of the blood thinner? Because we need to relay that information somehow to the physicians or the surgeons. Um, as you will see, there are some important decisions that are made based on that information. So it's, a, it's an important question to know when was the last dose of Eliquis given, and now what do we do? Answers are, proceed with surgery the next morning, which will be about 36 hours from the last dose of Eliquis. Cancel the surgery and schedule after five days because the patient is taking Eliquis. Last dose was just last night. Cancel the surgery and schedule it day after tomorrow. No need to hold Eliquis and may proceed with surgery next day or any time. So I'll pause there and let you guys answer. So let me know when the polling ends and So I see two answers. Okay. All right, so we got some answers. Um, we predominantly got uh, choice number two and choice number three, which is cancel the surgery and schedule it after five days and cancel the surgery and schedule it after, day after tomorrow. 
Um, so 33% of the people answered um, choice three, and I think that's the right answer. Um, and and I'll, as I proceed with my talk, I'll explain you why. Um, the patient is stable. The half-life of Eliquis is 12 hours. So we typically want to stop Eliquis for 48 hours prior to going for any surgery where there's risk of bleeding. This is gonna be an intra-abdominal surgery. Um, and if the last dose of Eliquis was 36 hours prior to the scheduled time of surgery, we are better off delaying it um, another 12 to 24 hours and operating not the next day, but the day after. Now, of course, this is, this is a theoretical question and um, you know, the surgeons depend, of course, on the comfort, of the comfort level of the surgeon. They may want to you know, not wait till the next day, but operate the same day, delaying another 12 hours next evening instead of next morning. That's also gonna be an appropriate option. But if we are seeing this patient as a console, we'll say, well, hold 48 hours and then operate. Uh, if it's an emergent scenario, then you think about some antidotes that you can give if it needs to be given. Um, in the case of uh, Eliquis and Zeralto, we have alpha indexinate, which is very expensive, but it's uh, it's an agent that can be used to reverse the effect, anticoagulant effect of Eliquis or Zeralto. So we have some options. So I'm glad that we got 33% people who got that answer right. Um, and maybe 66% thought five days. That's not the right choice because the half-life of Eliquis is 12 hours and it does not need to be held in any scenario for five days. The holding time should be 48 hours for uh, high-risk procedures where there's risk of bleeding. Uh, for low-risk procedures, 24 hours is enough uh, if there's not high risk of bleed because by holding it for 24 hours, 50% of the agent is out with two half-lives and we are in a safe zone. On the other hand, if the patient is going for a highly vascular organ such as liver, brain, or spine surgery, and if they have any renal dysfunction, then the holding time should be ideally for three days because then we give 72 hours for a good washout of the drug before going for surgery, especially in an elective setting. If it's an emergent surgery, then I have already described the options. So this slide talks about you know, what happens in a normal environment within our blood vessels. So the physical barrier is intact, and so does when the physical barrier, the in inner lining of our blood vessels is intact, the biochemical barriers are also intact, and, and the normal milieu is such that we have these agents causing a vasodilatation of the vessels. You can see prostacycline helps you with that, nitric oxide. Then you have agents which help avoid the stickiness of the blood cells, especially the platelets, to the inner lining of the walls of the blood vessels. And nitric oxide, IL-10, play that role. Then you have your natural anticoagulants that are circulating in your blood vessels. You have thrombomodulin, you have heparin sulfate, tissue factor inhibitor. You know, all these things are working together to avoid the blood clot formation inside the vessel. And then you have your natural TPAs that are circulating as well to avoid, you know, if there is a thrombus, quickly lyse it, break it. So that's how you, know, you have the blood circulating in your system and with the help of these vasodilative agents, anti-adhesion molecules, anticoagulants, profibrinolytic agents that are produced in your body, you keep sanity. The patients who have certain disease states or lack of these agents or molecular defects, uh, as, you, as, you, as you've heard of patients having lupus anticoagulant, having recurrent thrombosis, getting DVTs or factor V Leiden deficiencies or prothrombin gene mutations, all these genetic disorders, they come back and you'll see that they have DVTs in their legs and the veins or the arm or other places. So, because they have an imbalance in this whole milieu of things and genetic defects. So what happens during an injury um, within the inner linings of blood vessels? This whole milieu is disturbed. And now, you know, the body senses, the, the blood vessels sense that something needs to be done. There is a damage and we have to 
block this this avenue where the damage in the endothelial lining has happened, so let's start repairing it or having control there, and the whole environment changes. Now you, your vasodilatory agents, instead of vasodilating, you may have an agent that takes over which causes constriction because the vessels wants to constrict, and that happens with the help of an endothelin produced inside the body. Then you have uh, anti-adhesion molecules that, you know, you have your platelets that start circulating around and they rev up so that they attract more platelets, which then lead to a whole cascade of secondary hemostasis leading to thrombus formation and fibrosis. Your, your exposed tissue factors, factor V, act as um, becoming more coagulant instead of having an anticoagulant effect. So the whole thing reverses. Now you, are, you have created a milieu where you want to have a clot formation. Now you have a plasminogen activator inhibitor. Plasminogen is an enzyme which converts, you know, into, helps to convert plasmin that breaks the clot, but then now you have an inhibitor that starts acting up. So in, 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 in a situation where there is endothelial injury, the, the scenario reverses. And, and that's what the next few slides are gonna cover. So whenever the, there is breakdown of an endothelial barrier, there are two sets of uh, events that take place. One is primary hemostasis, one is the secondary. The primary hemostasis is mainly the platelet plug formation at the site of endothelial injury. And the secondary hemostasis then further activation of other platelets, which then the whole cascade happens leading to thrombus formation, eventually fibrosis, fibrin clot formation. The secondary hemostasis is mainly happening on the surfaces of the platelets, the other platelets that are accumulating at the site of endothelial injury. Why is this all important? Especially if you talk to the cardiologist, this is a very important sequence of events that's are, that, that are happening when a patient has a heart attack. So in acute heart attacks, ST elevation MIs, the blood clot forms inside the blood vessels, inside the coronaries, and this is, this is the whole cycle that's revved up. Uh, and, and that's why you see us being aggressive with these anaplatelet agents. We use two anaplatelet agents in all our MI patients. And in an acute scenario, we are using also the anticoagulants because we are trying to act against these pathways that have been activated. Patient had an endothelial injury inside the blood, art, blood vessel of the heart, they formed a blood clot. Now that blood clot leads to cessation of flow downstream inside that blood vessel. That's an acute ST elevation MI. Or even for the sake of non-ST elevation MI, the mechanisms are pretty much the same. So we use these agents not only to inhibit uh, the platelets which are revved up and gathering at the site of endothelial injury, but also the anticoagulants to help lyse that process, to help stop that process. So the slide depicts um, an injury inside the collagen endothelial barrier, and you can see that the platelet rolls, it tends to tether. Uh, it uses different receptors which have been listed out there. Um, you know, the rolling, the tethering, the arrest of the platelet, meaning getting attached to that site of injury and then inviting other platelets to get accumulated at that site. That's the whole process that takes place in an event when there is a vascular injury. And on the surface of the platelets, these are the different receptors. The thromboxane receptor, the thrombin PPAR1, PAR2 receptors, the ADP receptors are there, which are activating and um, creating a milieu for other platelets to come join them, have a clot, have a plug, and then activating the series of secondary hemostasis, which then leads to thrombus formation. So this is all happening right at the site of endothelial injury. And why this slide is important is because it depicts some of the receptors where our antiplatelet agents act. So keep in mind the P2Y12 receptor where some of our important antiplatelet agents act. Keep in mind the thromboxane receptors where aspirin acts. So, so these are the important ones. I have already described the main functions of antiplatelets and anticoagulants, but what does the platelet do when there is endothelial injury? It has two main functions. 
plug formation at the site of injury, which is mediated by those receptors that I've listed, and the von Willebrand factor and the collagen. And it also provides a phospholipid surface to activate the process of secondary hemostasis, coagulation cascade activation. So these, this is what the secondary hemostasis it, process looks like. It has an extrinsic pathway, which is activated by tissue factor, which comprises of factor 7, 2, 10, and then the intrinsic pathway, which is listed on the left side of the screen, which is starting from factor 12, and then downstream, they both merge at the level of factor 10A, where factor 5 converts the prothrombin to thrombin, which then converts the fibrinogen to fibrin. And as I have listed, nearly all reactions are occurring on the activated platelet surface. Not, the slide doesn't tell you to, to memorize all of this, but it's, again, important to understand where some of the anticoagulants are going to function. I've already shown you the picture of the platelet and the receptors, so keep in mind when you think about the mechanism of action of these antiplatelets. Now, this slide, you can refer to it later and see where some of the anticoagulant actions are, mechanism of actions are at what level. Before moving on, just briefly discussing the fibrin physiology. Um, you know, once the thrombuses are forming, your fibrinogen is activated, um, the cross-linking happens, and you start forming more of a plug of fibrin. And this is important to know because you're going to see in the next subsequent slides, when Dr. Khan likes to run and give a TPA, how does that work? How does that come into play in the whole scheme of things? Because again, stroke is a plug inside the vessel supplying the brain and he's trying to lyse that blood clot. So this is just an in vivo uh, picture of a colored um, micrograph showing the whole process of clot formation on top of the platelets inside the blood vessel. So as you can see on this slide, the TPA helps to convert plasminogen into plasmin, which then starts breaking this chain, which is forming around the platelets, trying to form a whole blood clot. So that's what the TPA does. And you know, in this scenario, when the, when, when the clot starts breaking up, the D-dimer level goes up. And you, know, you, guys are, you guys are pretty privy to that, and you measure your D-dimer levels on some occasions. Now, what does the procoagulant milieu does initially in case of injury is that it, your own body is producing this PAI inhibitor which is inhibiting your natural TPA. And therefore, your plasmin is not coming into play, and you start getting all this platelet plug formation whenever the endothelial injury happens. So just to keep in mind. But then when you give the TPA, you try to overcome this process. So just a quick review. Um, Coagulation factor activation, it occurs on the surface of the platelet, the phospholipid cell surface, generates thrombin, thrombin orchestrates the thrombosis beyond that hemostatic plug where the initial injury has happened. And as you're aware, there are certain natural um, occurring anticoagulants in your body. And when they are not there, genetically, for whatever reason, that puts you at risk of having thrombosis formation, DVTs, um, we talked about that earlier. Protein C and protein S um, turns off the coagulation cascade. It's a naturally occurring protein in your body. Um, similarly, antithrombin is there that modulates the anticoagulation, then, and you have your own fibrinal system available, which metabolizes any thrombus formation inside the body, inside the blood vessels. So before we go on with other slides, there's a question. Patient with CVA, he received TPA given an emergency room at 9 a.m. today. You're a nurse, um, and at change of shift around 7 p.m., uh, you're getting a sign out. You're going to start your shift. You notice that the patient order set does not contain any antiplatelet orders. Now, you as a nurse are used to seeing patients with CVA should be on some antiplatelet agents. Typically, when you admit patients with CVA, they're on aspirin, they're on Plavix, or maybe both. Now you are concerned. You are, you know, you are not happy. Why the patient is not on blood thinners, uh, on antiplatelet agents? Not, 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 not the blood thinner, but the antiplatelet agents. So you are gonna, you are planning to call the hospitalist on call at eight o'clock. 
hey doc, this patient had a CVA th this morning, got the TPA, I see no endoplatelets on board, no aspirin. So the question is, what is the optimal timing of starting the endoplatelets aspirin after the TPA? Should the hospitalist and you both decide to start the aspirin today, same day when the patient received the TPA, choice number one, or same evening, which is now? Did they miss it in the morning and now you should start in the same evening, right now? Or should it be started next day after 24 hours of TPA? Or we should wait two days after the TPA to start the aspirin? Why this question is important because it has, it has implications. TPA, as we all know, is a very strong agent with a very high risk of bleeding. Whenever you do that, you know, you're concerned about bleeding, especially when it involves the brain. So let's see what, how you guys answer this. All right, so we got um, three answers there, and I think um, that's the correct answer. So you guys are pretty much aware of this um, disease state, and you're, you know your protocol, so that's good. Um, within first 24 hours, aspirin should not be given, and if somebody has written that order, that should be, needs to be caught and has to be changed. It has to be given after 24 hours of TPA, very important point. Now, on the same topic, I, I have not made a question, but I want to point out the role of DVT prophylaxis in any way or form. Talking to the neurologist, they like not to use any sub-Q heparin for DVT or Lovenox for DVT during that first 24-hour period. So be aware of that. Um, if, if you see some um, deviation from that protocol, discuss with your hospitalist, discuss with your neurologist within the first 24 hours after TPA administration. From cardiology standpoint, if our patients have received the TPA for an acute MI, we do want to fight that anti, the, the platelet um, you know, revved up process where the platelet plug is forming in acute MI setting. So we start antiplatelets early on after our TPA. We do give our aspirin uh, upfront after the TPA. Um, and, and same goes for Plavix as well. However, we do adjust our dose of the Plavix depending on the age of the patient. So coming to the next section, which is briefly gonna talk about the mechanism of action of these antiplatelets and anticoagulants. So how does the aspirin works? I showed you that receptor. It's a COX-2 inhibitor um, working at the level of the thromboxane receptors. Um, and that's pretty much how it functions um, to inhibit the, uh, the function of the platelets. So it's a, it, it inhibits one of the platelet receptors. And it's an irreversible inhibitor of COX-1. And why, why is that? Because platelets don't have a nuclei. So once the aspirin works on the receptors and inhibits, uh, the effect is uh, irreversible. How about the other antiplatelet agents? How do they work? Um, if you remember, I showed you the picture of the P2Y2 receptors, both Tracagalor, Prasugril, and the third agent, which is um, Plavix, or Clopidogrel, they all inhibit the P2Y2, Y12 receptors on the platelets. Um, they all, if you see, the Plavix and Prasugril go through the liver um, and have a first-pass metabolism effect, whereas Tricaglor uh, does not have to go through the liver to make uh, this inhibitor function. Um, both Prasugril and tri Tricaglor, or Brillanta is the other name, are more potent antiplatelets as compared to Plavix, and that's how they got their integration um, in the setting of acute MIs. And, and we commonly use a lot of Brillanta over here. It's a BID agent, um, whereas uh, Prasugril and Plavix are once a day agent. This slide 
shows you again the whole sequence of the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway which is happening on the surface of the platelets um, after having the tissue factor being exposed, as the cell surface being exposed, the phospholipids being exposed. This is the events that are taking place to help form the thrombus and the, the, the clot formation. So you can see the heparins are working at the level of factor nine. You have factor vitamin K, which um, inhibits the factor seven. Then you have the direct thrombin inhibitors, which are, um, I'm gonna show you, acting directly against the thrombin. And then you have the factor nine A inhibitors. So different spots where these anticoagulants are working. And because of this extrinsic and intrinsic pathway, there are so many avenues and that's what led to the evolution of these different agents because the pharmaceutical research evolved and it looks into all these different avenues to see if they can come up with an agent and finally I have an agent that, that helps to uh, provide this anticoagulant effect. So the newer oral anti-agents which have been around for the last 10 years almost, apixaban, rivaroxaban, aduxaban, they are factor 10 hay inhibitors. They are oral agents and they're working at that level of where factor uh, 10, uh, with the help of factor 5A is converting prothrombin to thrombin. So they're inhibiting that pathway, and that's how they're helping to prevent the thrombus formation. And on the right hand, when you see the debigatran, argatroban, bivalirudin, they're directly inhibiting the thrombus or thrombin, which then subsequently helps to convert the fibrinogen to fibrin. So those are the mechanism of actions of these agents. The slide tells you the differences in the um, tip, mainly the, the onset. I think the thing to remember is onset. When you give Plavix to our patients, it takes about six hours or greater than six hours, depending on the loading dose of Plavix you have given. It doesn't start acting up right away. So therefore, um, you know, our initial loading dose in acute MI setting is large. We give about 600 milligrams. Whereas if you look at the Brillant and Prasugril, they start acting quick, the onset is quick two to six hours for Prasugril, Tracaglor, Berlenta is two to four hours. And therefore there are strong platelet inhibitors, not only from the standpoint of onset of action, but even uh, the, the potency of platelet inhibition. The 2B3A receptor inhibitors, you hardly see that on the floors. Um, you may once in a while see it in the ICU. Um, it's an IV form of an antiplatelet agent. Uh, again, working on those platelet receptors, uh, we do use occasionally aptifibotide integralin, which is in the middle column. Um, the half-life is short, as you can see for integralin. The plasma half-life is two hours. The return of platelet function, typically once it's stopped, is after four hours. So if you ever have a patient on this agent, and there is a sheath in the groin that needs to be pulled, take a step back. Talk to your cardiologist. Find out, hey, the patient is on IV integralin. Do we need to hold it for two to four hours before we pull the sheath? And the answer you will find is 99% of the time is gonna be yes, hold, at least for four hours prior to pulling the sheath. Because we, we, we risk the extensive bleed in the groin if you're gonna pull our sheets on these agents. So keep that in mind. Um, similarly, tyrofaban has a similar profile just like aptifibotide, just like integrin. Whereas apsiximab, which is in the first column, the other name is Riopro, it's not a monoclonal peptide, instead it's an antibody fragment. So the half-life is long and return of, return of platelet function after stopping takes about 12 hours. However, you can reverse it by giving the platelets, so keep that in mind. So there are differences between aptifibotide tyrofaban versus apsiximab. The difference is return of platelet function. And if, if you think, can they be reversed, then apsiximab or Yopro can be reversed by giving the platelet transfusion. However, do you, you don't you, you see a use of these agents very often. Oral direct factor inhibitors, these days, you commonly see a lot of rivaroxaban and apexaban. Uh, these are oral agents. The indications are for 
DVT and PE treatment, prevention of um, stroke in AFib patients, prophylaxis after um, hip or knee surgery. Those are some of the indications. So dabigatrin is a direct thrombin inhibitor. Half-life is 12 to 17 hours. Elimination is mainly renal. Whereas the rivaroxaban, apixaban, and doxaban is the factor 10 inhibitor. The half-life is pretty much similar, seven to 11 hours. In some literature just suggests 12 hours. So just for the sake of ease, you know, I just keep 12 hours in my mind. And there is variable renal and hepatic excretion of these agents. So for apixaban, the renal excretion is only 25%. Uh, for rivaroxaban, it's a little higher. Um, for doxaban, a lot of it gets excreted to the renal route. So, Bivalirudin, Angiomax, um, we use it in our ACS patients very commonly. Um, it's an IV form of a direct thrombin inhibitor. Again, half life is 25 minutes. Um, it's used in PCI, which is the stent procedure, percutaneous coronary intervention. Or the other indication is also we use it for our patients who have um, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or HIT. So it's another agent that we use. Argatroban, um, the clearance is to the hepatic. So if they have um, kidney problems and the kidney functions are worse, and if their patient has having a HIT, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, then this is the agent of choice because its excretion is through the liver, hepatic clearance. And therefore, that's the agent that we use in that scenario. Whereas if they have a hepatic dysfunction, the liver functions are not doing well, then in that scenario, we, are, we use bivalirudin because the clearance is mostly to the kidneys. So this brings to our, I think this is the, gonna be the last question. Patients is scheduled for cardiac cath after one week, has coronary, history of coronary artery disease, he's currently taking aspirin and Plavix, you're assessing the patient and assigned to give uh, pre-op recommendations. So you are essentially working in a role of a pre-op nurse. Um, you're seeing this patient in surgical uh, clearance uh, center and you're scheduling this patient for this left heart cat. What do you tell your patients reference to stopping the anaplatelet agents? This is a question which comes up very commonly, even on the floors and of course, you know, one to two weeks prior to your heart cat, patient's heart cat. So as a nurse, the options are tell the patient, hold Plavix for seven days and continue aspirin. Option two, hold both agents for seven days. Option three, continue Plavix and stop aspirin for seven days. Option four, do not stop. Option five, hold both agents for 48 hours. I guess nobody's answering, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Let me know and we'll um, close the polling whenever you guys are ready. All right, so maybe the question was confusing or there were five options instead of four that um, if, if I have an audience, they haven't taken a jab on this one. But the answer is four, do not stop. This question comes up very often. We get phone calls. Uh, when we're in the cat lab, uh, we're about to take the patient to the lab to start the, the case and the patient tells us, well, somebody told them to stop the aspirin and the Plavix or one agent. Uh, but typically for our coronary artery disease patients, when we are gonna take them to the cath lab, we do not want to stop the antiplatelet agents. However, if they are on anticoagulants, such as Coumadin or Eliquis or Xeralto, then we need to have more discussion and some clear guidance from our cardiologist who's gonna perform the procedure. And this discussion in that scenario should take place a week in advance because on the approach of the cath, we may or may not stop the anticoagulant, or 
if we are certain that we will, we will need to do a stent placement, we may stop the anticoagulant. So again, if the patient is taking antiplatelets and anticoagulants, then make sure we have a clear guidance from the cardiology office in reference to stopping the anticoagulants made by Coumadin, Eliquis, Zeralto, Dabigatrin, and how far in advance and what will be our, if there will be any bridging protocol involved or not. So optimal duration of dole antiplatelet therapy, such as aspirin, Plavix, aspirin, Berlenta, after putting a stent, this is a vast subject, this is a vast topic. It will take easy at least two hours if you're gonna delve into a detailed discussion, but I'll keep it short. I, I think it's uh, typically looking at the patient, trying to figure out what's their risk uh, in terms of if they have um, a small blood clot formed in the blood vessels, what's the ischemic risk. If we don't continue to use the blood tube antiplatelet agents in the long run, what are the risks of stent having a clot or stent thrombosis? And we look at certain factors. Mainly this is, this is a decision that cardiologist makes in collaboration with other colleagues and other physicians and the primary care physician, looking at all these different variables, patient's age, heart functions, bleeding risk, comorbidities, number of stents, number of heart procedures, overlapping stents. And again, you know, when we do decide we want to continue the dual antiplatelet therapy for a certain amount of time beyond the recommended time range, beyond certain number of months, then we also look at the bleeding risks uh, because the bleeding risks are higher in certain profile patients um, old patients, old female, low body weight, kidney disease, diabetes, those are some of the, the, the avenues where the bleeding risk is high. So it's a balancing act, essentially. So shorter duration of dual antiplatelet therapy for those patients who are high risk of bleeding. And again, longer duration of dual antiplatelet therapy for patients who have higher ischemic risk and lower bleeding risk, we use longer duration. Uh, Typically, for in a setting of an ST elevation MI or non-ST elevation MI, we like to use our dual antiplatelet agents such as aspirin or plavix or aspirin or Belenta for at least one year. And this pretty much concludes my talk. Um, thank you very much for um, listening and joining. I'll be more than happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, we're done.